this discussion that happened between um, Alami Lauren and uh, Gene Kuger and Anna Kasparian, we're going to get into that before I, I go into that clip. And we are going to analyze that because there's a lot to be said there. Um, it just so happened that Friday, I believe this was Friday when I made this comment. I actually was talking about Jink Uger's tweet about uh, defunding the police. Um, Eric clipped that from the live stream and posted it as a, a clip. And it was brought to my attention from you guys that um, he deleted that tweet. <laughs> he deleted the tweet, but the tweet is still in my video. So... One of the, I mentioned something that I recommend that Jink Uger should do. So I don't know if he saw that clip or not. This could have already been planned to bring Alami on and have this discussion with her. But I want to remind you what I said. Here's what I said. Now, this was last week, just last week. Calling it like I see it tonight. Now, if people like Jink Uger would have taken the time to talk to people who are abolitionists, to talk to people like those who organize 10 Demands for Justice, Nick, my comrade at RBN, was one of those people who organized 10 Demands for Justice. He would know about the road to abolition. Okay, so that's what I said last week, that he should actually talk to people who are abolitionists so he can hear like what the road and the pathway is to that. Or you could just look at the website, 10 Demands for Justice. It's laid out there for you. Now, again, I don't know if Jink saw that clip or not. It was brought to my attention. Like I told you, he deleted that tweet that he had about defunding the police. But... He did bring on Olami Aloran for this discussion about prison abolition. And I think Olami really like hit the nail on the head. So let's get into this discussion here with TYT and Olami Aloran about prison abolition. Let's get into it. I have a conversation that I've been really looking forward to. Uh, the prison prison abolitionist movement is definitely gaining a little bit of steam. Uh, the debates and conversations surrounding it have been kind of front and center on social media. And I think it's really important to understand uh, what the abolitionist movement is, what they want to do in terms of criminal justice reform. And joining us today is someone I deeply respect, a wonderful woman by the name of Oleyemi Aluren, who is a public defender for the Legal Aid Society in New York, and also a political commentator. Ole, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for having me, I'm excited. Let me just start off by saying thank you so much. I know I thanked you on social media, but I wanna thank you now that I get to talk to you because yeah. this has been something that, to be fair, I, I think the way that I communicate and frame things was not friendly to people who uh, identify as abolitionists. Yeah. You got that right, because Anna has had a couple of videos, and so was Jink Uger, where they have had these cringe moments about police abolition, about defunding the police to the point where, where they almost started to sound like they're right wing. Just, just keeping it real. This is the same person, Anna Gasparian, who made that statement last year that she agrees with criminalizing homeless people in Los Angeles, which is something that Jeffrey Katzenberg, the guy who donated that $20 million to TYT, wanted to do. You see why where people get their money actually matters? Let's go on. And so I think... It's easy to immediately attack and dogpile, yeah. but you were the one person who didn't do that. And you actually provided some information, some answers yes. to our questions that was so helpful. So I thought it would be better to have a, a more elaborate conversation about it on the show. And so let she won't talk to anyone who's going to criticize her, basically, is what she's letting you know. Let's uh, start off by kind of understanding what is the prison abolition movement? What would that ideally look like? You criticized a whole movement without even knowing what it was about. Okay. All right, so first of all, thank y'all for having me. Um, I didn't dogpile, I did not attack because I understand that it sounds wild. It sounds wild to anybody the first time you hear it. Even as somebody when it was first presented to me that abolition was even a concept, 
I was in the middle of writing a thesis about how the criminal system is racist and unjust. And even I was like, abolish all the prisons, that seems absurd. And my professor, my professor presented me with reading materials and it was a process. I can't tell you what day I woke up and decided it, but I recognized that, listen, we all are raised in a society that tells us prisons are fundamental. One of the first things we learn, you know, cops, robbers, police are good. We need to know 911, we think of that that way. So we, we see the criminal justice system like water, oxygen, air and these kinds of things. And so I expect people to have pushback, I expect it to sound absurd because my mother tells me it's absurd every other day. So I, I do get it, <laughs> so I wasn't upset, but what it really is is, I just want to comment on a point that Alami just made about what we're taught when we're younger. And it's true. Like when I was in school, like kindergarten, first grade, one of those years in elementary school, they did teach us that the policeman is your friend. The policeman here to protect you. If you need help, contact the police. They're here to help you. And then that's the version that the school district would give you. But then, especially those of us who are African-American, there was the version that came from my parents, which was don't trust the police. <laughs> if you ever get pulled over by the police, this is what you do. If you ever need help or in trouble, you're better off calling one of us than calling the police. So she's right to point that out. Like that's what we are taught with in the education system. So we pretty much been ingrained with it at a very young age, to be honest. It's a vision of tomorrow. We people here, you know, abolish prisons now, and they think we mean open up all the prisons, close all the courts, and it's done tomorrow. We recognize realistically it does not work. Like, but what we're saying is, listen, we currently have a massive prison industrial complex. This is a country that one once went from what two hundred thousand people, maybe nationwide, being in prisons, and now two million people. More prisons begets more prisons. They make more. The more we incarcerate, uh, the more they continue to incarcerate and police these same kinds of communities. But yet. Every day we say crime is getting worse. We don't feel any safer. We have the same exact hysteria despite constantly giving more money to police, constantly putting more money into the criminal system. So what we're saying is instead of the resources that we've placed in building this large prison industrial complex, let's instead address the root causes of crimes. Because I know people tend to think uh, an abolitionist is an anarchist, uh, you know, the purge, we want danger. That's not what it is. What we're saying is the same communities that are being criminalized, the same communities that you're calling the criminal defendants, those are the victims too, right? It's the same community being over police are the same police uh, communities being over incarcerated. So they're also under resourced. As a public defender, I could say the vast majority of the people in the criminal system live well beneath the poverty line. And when I say well beneath the poverty line, I myself identify as the poor and I would not be able to afford my own services. I mean, completely destitute. And so if the majority of the people in the system are this, they're under resourced in that way. And the issues that we're having are coming out of those communities and uh, not having the resources for mental health. You know, there are more people in America, there are more people suffering from mental health issues in prisons and there are in mental health hospitals. Let's talk about something here that Alami just mentioned about resources. This is important for people to note. It's true. Uh, if you're poor, if you're working class, nine times out of 10, you might spend more time in the system. And I'll explain to you how that works. If you cannot afford cash bail, you're kind of stuck there. You're kind of stuck there until you have a trial or court case or whatever that can prove that you were in the right, not in the wrong, and then you're released. A lot of the people that are sitting in, in jail may not necessarily be guilty per se. Some of them are there because they cannot afford cash bail. That's important. This is why we do need some type of bail reform. I've talked about this before. Not everybody can afford cash bail. If you are wealthy, however, you most likely can afford cash bail. This is how someone like an R. Kelly was able to walk off through cash bail the first time that they brought him in. So if you're rich, the system works really well for you. If you are poor or working class, the system does not work well for you. So it, it is problematic, right? So I'm glad that she mentioned that. I also want to add in here too, what Olami just said about taking the resources and putting, taking the resources from the police officers and putting it into the, back into the community. This is not something that is new to Anna Kasparian or to Jink Uger. This has been said on this show multiple times when defund was actually popular back when they were on that train and they agreed with defunding the police when it was popular. They already know this. They know that. So to me, it's just interesting that they're trying to pretend like, oh, they're just going to let all these people go. And that is not what prison abolition is about. We're not saying let everybody just run free and do whatever they want to do. What we are saying is that resources can be allocated in different ways. And there are other people that can step in and help in those areas where the police are not helping. The police are not helping when it comes to mental health issues. They're not trained to do that. 
but they're the ones showing up on the scene. That's a problem. They don't know how to handle it. We've seen this happen multiple times. I don't think police officers should do traffic stops. Those go incredibly wrong, especially if you're black. Let's just be real. So there are other people. I think social workers could be involved in some of these situations. Psychiatrists can be involved in some of these situations. And mental health counselors can be involved as well. So there are areas where we're using police, where people are just thrown into the prison system, and some of those people shouldn't even be there. So yes, all of this needs to be changed. And I'm, I'm past this, the stage of reform myself because there have been reforms that have been implemented, but it's never enough. Reform does not go far enough, whether it's criminal justice, healthcare, or education. I think the whole system needs to be rebuilt and that's how you get there. And you do need to change the prison system that we have in this country. But we have that. We're saying, okay, let's start taking that money away from the police. We have we have overinflated budgets. We have large police forces, so much that one would argue that this is a police state. If by over time, over time, we start taking this money away and instead putting it into the community infrastructure, we will eventually have a society that doesn't rely on mass incarceration. So it's a step by step process like that. Right. So Olay, um, go ahead, Jake. I think there's a couple of different issues here, right? So mm -hmm. there's the politics and the policy, right? Mm -hmm. And there's I'm sure a bunch of things we obviously agree on. So for example, uh, would I abolish some type of prison? So obviously I, I want to get rid of private prisons tomorrow. Uh, they, yeah. they make no sense, it's all the wrong incentives. It's uh, we're basically paying people to take away people's freedom. So they're gonna do that at a larger and larger rate to profit off of it. So there's plenty of circumstances where some form of abolition makes sense. Uh, and I think that at the end of the day, we'll probably agree on a, on a Great majority of things, but uh, help me understand what the long term vision is. So you explain how we're going to get there. But one of the issues I have with the abolition movement is people are reluctant to say what the final product is. So is there no prisons at all? Or is it a prison under a different name or a reduced prison? So let's let's get clarity on that. That's actually not true what Jink just said, that people don't talk about the final product. Again, and Eric, you can put the link to this uh, for people in the chat. If you go to 10 Demands, which was started by a group of ab abolitionist activists, uh, Nick from RBN is one of them. Awkward is also one of them. I've interviewed him before about, he knows a lot about uh, policing and about the prison system. Uh, you can find that interview on my channel. You got to go back over a year. Um, but that, that's a really good interview that I, I did with Awkward a while back about that. 10 Demands explains just what Jink was just asking. They do talk about, okay, how do we get there? And here's the final result. Again, like I said, there Jink is not doing his research on this. He really isn't. 10 Demands is a public website. Everybody can see how many times have you watched RBN and you heard Nick mention 10 Demands? How many times have you seen them on other people's shows? Like, this is not a, a secret. 10 Demands for Justice, it's, it's a movement with abolitionists and everybody should follow that website. Here it is. Thank you so much for that, Eric. 10 Demands for Justice, www.10demandsforjustice.com. Look it up. They break down each step. There's 10 and they tell you how to get there. So what Jink just said, that's actually not true. I think, let me just say, I am not the full architect of what are the visions for every place, right? But I think we do want to get to a place where we say, all right, warehousing people, warehousing people isn't uh, addressing the issues. I recognize, while I do believe that we have a, a country and a society that sensationalizes crime, what people think people are in the prison system for, what people are being charged and incarcerated for, is not what it is. I've represented over a thousand people, and I've yet to meet this, you know, big bad evil person as someone who I couldn't see. I couldn't see exactly how they ended up here and what different institutions have failed them. That being said. Um, Obviously, we need we need community involvement with communities think they need. That's the first thing on on how we address these different issues. And oftentimes we do have that. Um, when it comes to it, I know we're thinking of the serial killers, the type of these kinds of, you know, who have they come? Very few, very few of anything you ever see. I've never seen them. Um, I think I can't say whether or not it's going to be 
they abolish all the prisons or what that's gonna look like the day that comes to and policy implementation, what system we're gonna come from. But I do think we are, we do have to start looking to different countries that don't have the prison industrial complex we have, whose prisons that's don't right. look like what we have, who don't have these kinds of side effects and seeing how they address these issues and what we could have, what kind of infrastructure we could have in place. But I do think as far as it currently is, the mental health problems are exacerbated. We still have those people. We're still as a country, we're paying for all of the big bad evil people that we're putting in, we quote unquote put on prisons. We're paying for all of that. We're not exactly solving the problems and all of the issues are still um, recycling. So I can't say specifically what the, the structure would look like. I think that's gonna re require the communities themselves to decide, you know what, how do we address, we best address the problems? What do we think we have there and what we would have happen to these people? So I can't definitively answer you, Cenk, but I do understand that concern. And I think a lot of that does come to maybe some misconceptions we have about crime and who's in the system and who's the majority of the people there and for what. Right. and and. He can look it up, Olami. He can look it up. People do like to point to the most violent uh, uh, criminals that are in prison. She's right about that. They do like to make that talking point, right? What about all the people who are in prison for weed? What about all those people? Do they need to be locked in a cage? No. No. We have to look at some of the other systems that that exist in other countries. Norway is a good example. Uh, we also have to ask ourselves, why is it that we have more crime than a lot of these other countries? Uh, that needs to be figured out. I think poverty is a big factor. I keep telling you a lot of crime is poverty driven. That is especially the case right here in the United States. You see that happen, right? Uh, what happens every year, every summer? Every summer, what, the crime rate goes up? We see this happen in cities like Chicago, New York, um, here in Boston too, that happens as well. Like, but we need to address the poverty issue in this country and we need to find a way to fix it. And I don't want to hear that we don't have the money. We have the money. They're just using it for other means. So let's look at our poverty rate and look at the poverty rate compared to some of those other countries. That's part of the problem. Yeah, that, look, I, I totally agree that, you know, I think poverty is a pretty good indicator of uh, whether someone has committed a crime, you know, like it, you can yeah. tie it to those root causes. So I totally understand that. In fact, you know, one of the things that LA actually did right, uh, but it was kind of destroyed by COVID was, uh, you know, Los Angeles had a pretty big problem with uh, gang violence. Right. And we're seeing it become more of a problem again because the programs like the diversion programs that were implemented that were so successful were no longer available during covid because people were um you know they had to isolate themselves in order to yeah. prevent the spread of covid and so i think that there are certainly programs that that can address those root causes in a, in a meaningful way but i but anna i think i think you're looking at this the wrong way i think she's looking at this as well, we, we've had a problem with gangs in LA and now it's increasing again. Maybe the question to ask is, but why are people joining gang gangs to begin with? Why do people join gangs to begin with? Is poverty an issue there? A lot of times, yes. Is it the fact that the community is not raising the children anymore? That could be part of it. Is part of it due to the fact that some people are growing up in single family homes where the father has been removed from the home? That could be part of it as well. So that's the thing. Always start with the why. And this is something I, I tell you guys a lot. Always start with the, but why are they doing it? But why is it that way? That can help you get to the solution. I don't know. You can tell they they really got some heat on Twitter. These these videos that Anna has made, the tweet that Jink had about the defund movement, which someone put in my chat on the last video, told me that he deleted it. They must have gotten some heat. <laughs> I'm just I'm just telling you, just letting you know. I think I feel like sometimes when it comes to this debate, we're kind of talking past each other because of mm -hmm. the terminology, right? So what I like to think about is when I think about the ideal. Uh, I wouldn't say ideal, I'm sure it has its own flaws, but when I look at models in other countries that seem to have worked, I look to Norway, which mm -hmm. I will say when I first heard about Norway and the way they do things with their criminal justice system, I found it, this is like years and years ago, I thought it was super questionable, like Anders Breivik getting sentenced to 21 years and he has like 
a, like a nice situation with like a PlayStation that isn't updated enough for him. He wants the the latest model. But you look at their recidivism rates and their recidivism rates are so low compared to the United States because yeah. we don't rehabilitate. So would you say that a model like one that's being implemented in Norway is a good goal to work toward? Or does the abolitionist movement want to go further than that? Again, I think Anna needs to realize that again, a country like Norway doesn't have the level of poverty that we do in the United States. We have to, this all goes back to poverty, you guys. Let me, so I think a fundamental component to why people argue abolition, it's not because it's not an unwillingness to embrace reform. It's not this inherent issue with reform. It's recognizing that the criminal system in the US is not a mistake. You know, the actors and the powers that be wanted to operate the way it does. People are always willing to, to advocate for reform as an abolitionist. I'm constantly, listen, let's, I have to spend my days fighting bail reform, fighting for bail reform and fighting to defend it even once we get it. Oftentimes what happens is even the modest, the most modest of reforms that are suggested even make it, you see the exact actors that be, you see the lawmakers, you see the, the police unions, you see them fight you tooth and nail because they don't want the system to change from what it is. So it's not that an abolitionist has a problem with reform or they don't think models like that work in places. The difference is those countries have a, different, a very different focus. Maybe in some, some places where you see they have a, re, a rehabilitative criminal system, it's not an accident. You know, It's not an accident that we have the criminal system we have and they have that, it's because their intentions are are different. What they use the system to do are different. Here in America, we have uh, uh, the prison industrial complex is just to be frank, it is nothing more but you know a legally sanctioned slavery. That's what it is. We have that's right. And the system that Anna was referring to in Norway, they actually rehabilitate the prisoners, unlike the prison system that we have in the United States. We don't rehabilitate them. They're supposed to, but they don't. So it's it's a completely different system than what we have. And you should watch that. Uh, documentaries about that, about the prison system in Norway. It's very different. It doesn't even really look like a prison. It looks like apartment complex based on what I saw, but the prisoners have a lot more freedom, but because they are rehabilitated, there is a difference and they're less likely to be repeat offenders and end up back in the system. Massively incarcerated in police particular communities. We use them for uh, prison labor, regardless, private or public prisons, people are used for prison labor. We take the poorest of the communities and we put them there and we charge them with major fines on top of on top of the time that they've spent, the psychological impacts of that, uh, of that on them and their families, the long the long lasting effects of criminalization and having a criminal record. And that does that because it seeks keeps particular communities and people subjugated. So it's not that I don't believe in a different world where we had a Nordic model, we could help the people incarcerated. What I'm saying is the criminal system we have is not designed to help those people at all. In fact, even yep. talking about it from the perspective of us, of the people, all of the people in the system being the problem. They all need rehabilitation, but in fact, that's not often what it is. It's that they're in the position in the first place that they live in communities that aren't helped and they're profiled and they're targeted in a particular kind of way. I just came home on the way here and there were over 10 cops on the corner of Flatbush Junction just harassing black kids, playing and arresting them because they said they felt or a soda splash on them and they arrested yep. them. And that's what's happening in black communities like where you live. So it's not that I disagree with you, Anna, that a Nordic model could be effective. It's that America doesn't have any interest in uh, implementing such a thing because they want the system to operate as it is. So that's why people want the system abolished because they're saying what it fundamentally is, is designed to reproduce this kind of injustice. That's okay, right. So in the meantime, then, um, mm -hmm. so let's. And that's something that she just pointed out about the police officers that were harassing the kids that were getting out of school in Brooklyn. I saw that picture uh, on Twitter as well. That's something that Jink and Anna, they don't have to deal with that. They probably never have had to deal with that. This is the thing when it's it's not in your community. They don't have to deal with they don't have to worry about that when they're just walking home or I don't know, I guess people don't really walk that much in LA, but if they're just hanging out like I don't know, outside of of their home or if they're just walking back from a restaurant or whatever, they don't have to worry about that. But a lot of times in black communities, especially in low income black communities in the United States, you do have to worry about that. I'm from Baltimore. I remember seeing police officers that I went to Baltimore school uh, for second grade and for fifth grade or part of fifth grade. And I remember seeing police officers just hanging out like on the corner outside of the school, outside of Lockham and Bundy. Like this, like it was, it was weird to me because I didn't, I didn't come from that. So having started school in Germany, we didn't, there are no cops like right outside your school. 
it was rare that I saw police in Germany. So going from that and then going to, to school in Baltimore and seeing the cops just hanging out, just waiting for you to do something wrong. And sometimes picking with people and harassing people, just trying to get someone for something. No one should have to live like that. We shouldn't have to live in a police state. To do that to kids, it's unbelievable. Say there's enough of a fight where people are on board for the abolitionist movement, right? Mm -hmm. In the meantime, as those root causes are being addressed, what does happen to perpetrators of violent crime? And I want to be specific about the types of individuals I'm talking about, right? Like, mm -hmm. I do believe that we over incarcerate. I do not think that most nonviolent offenders should be in prison. And when I say most nonviolent offenders, keep in mind, I'm considering like Wall Street goons who completely devastated our economy and led to countless foreclosures. I think people like that do deserve to <laughs> deal with some punishment, right? They yeah. typically don't. But um, just to get back to the question, so I'm a little concerned about what happens if living in California, living in Los Angeles, where we have a massive homeless population, many of whom have severe mental health issues that go untreated, undiagnosed. That is a result of the deinstitutionalization that started actually under JFK, right? Yeah. And there was widespread support for doing away with these mental health facilities because of all of the issues they had. They were abusive. Mm -hmm. uh, there were terrible, terrible examples of abuse. And so everyone was on board to do away with them. And the whole idea was, okay, we'll replace them with community-based mental health. But that didn't end up happening. So we ended up throwing the uh, baby out with the bathwater, if you yeah. will. So I yeah, but I think it's also important for Anna to mention that Los Angeles is hella expensive. California is hella expensive. Everybody keeps mentioning the homeless people that have mental health issues or the ones that are on drugs. What about the people who are homeless that were evicted because they couldn't afford to pay their rent? Come on, like people are people are flocking. They are leaving California and flocking to places like Texas for a reason. California is hella expensive. So that needs to be addressed. That's a problem. We don't have a Medicare for all healthcare system in this country either. So people are like, yeah, go, go, go to a mental health, you know, uh, treatment center and all that stuff with no insurance. That's another part of the problem. Again, always go back to the why. Yes, about what she said about JFK. Yeah, there's some truth to that. But why are they in that position to begin with? You are living in a state, and I know because Massachusetts, my state, is hella expensive too. And we have an increased home, homeless population. We have a mini skid row next to Boston Medical Center that was not there a couple of years ago. There was always homeless people, but it's increased. It's gotten worse. Again, Massachusetts, hella expensive. A lot of people just can't afford to live here anymore, especially in the Boston area. You have to address that. You have to address the poverty issue. That is a big part of the root of the problem here. Think about how this would play out if we applied it to prisons. And I think about people who do mass shootings on elementary school campuses, and those people need to be incapacitated. So what happens with people like that under a system? And how do you avoid throwing the baby out with the bathwater? You know, I think I usually don't get into a conversation it deserves. That's not something much uh, I, th I think about because I think oftentimes that's what leads to a carceral responses. Listen, I'm a human being like everybody else. There are gonna be people and things that I see and my initial reaction is throw them under the jail. You wanna feel that in your spirit. But what I wanna focus on is what I think is better and what ultimately would will prevent these kinds of issues from reoccurring. And oftentimes incarceration is just simply not the answer to that. I've never, I rarely, rarely do you see somebody go in prison or in jail and the situation becomes better. And in fact, even the few people that you see that do survive it, that come out and do other things, it's usually in spite of it and some other you know miracle scenario. So uh, when it comes to that, I don't, I don't, I don't like a conversation that deserves. I like a conversation of what I think uh, will help. But as far as throwing up the baby in the bathroom, water. Listen, like I said, this isn't this isn't something that happens tomorrow. And in any, even with the most modest of reform efforts that you even see be proposed, because reform is, we're walking, right? If, if you look at it as a long journey, we're walking from reform to hopefully this ultimate dream. They don't start off, they're not going to start off with the, with the 
with the uh, what you call it, the school shooters and these people. They're who are anom- who are by the way anomalies. Those are not the people that represent the are representative of who's mostly in the criminal system. It's just not the most people you walk into a court. You're just gonna see poor black and brown people there for like right. familial squats, squat uh, uh, squabbles. They're having issues. They're having in their relationships. You know these regular things, but it's not gonna be that. But um, it's not a matter of recognizing that these people aren't bad or bad or they haven't done something terrible or they don't deserve punishment. It's a requirement. I think we are required to interrogate how we got there. I think oftentimes, even when you see, if you even take the school shooter examples, right, or the amount of those we get recently, or the amount of shooters, mass shooters we have, period. And you see, they have manifestos, they have agendas, they have this. These are not people that are just jumping out the window like Batman villains. These are people that are coming to, they are making decisions to do things based on fundamental ideologies, different things that they think and believe. And I think we have to interrogate those as a society and root that out. Because the reality yep. is, whether or not we have prisons, don't have prisons, if we allow for these same things that cause it to exist, that we're, we're going to keep getting this. We're going to get these school shooters, we're going to get these mass shooters, no matter how we deal with them. So to me, those questions require us to say, okay, let's look at these bodies of alarmist criminals we like to think of in these examples, and let's try to figure out what they have in common. Because right now, the majority of the people in the criminal system, all they have in common is poverty and you know being of marginalized communities. But as far as these shooters, See? Let's let's interrogate how they got there. What's helping them get there? Usually, access to guns, widespread gun manufacturing, all these kinds of things. So, mm-hmm. my answer is still: let's figure out how we, we we prevent it from reoccurring. That's right. Do you hear what she just said? We need to ask ourselves: how did they get there? How did they get there? And how do we prevent that from reoccurring? She's right. So Ole, it, this is an interview, but it's also a discussion, right? So yes. I, I want to be clear about my thoughts uh, on it and then ask oh, your Lord. question. Look, yes. I, I think that uh, that if you say let's uh, reform prisons in a massive way, I totally mm-hmm. agree. Uh, wrong people are being in prison, totally agree. Uh, let's go to the root causes, totally agree. By the way, I wish the prison abolition movement would have a much more sound plan A, B, C, D. This is exactly how we're going to get to the ideal and goal and you and i just told you guys they do have those plans it's called 10 demands for justice go to 10 demands for justice.com and you'll see the steps and the plans you and people constantly say well i don't have all the details partly i understand that but partly it's incumbent upon you if you're in that movement to come up with a workable plan and you need, and especially as you said, Ole, in the beginning, if you're doing something that sounds as extreme as abolishing prisons, you better have an excellent plan. And and so far, I haven't really. What? Listen to what he says here, you guys. Here comes classic jink. Okay. Class- you better have an excellent plan. And here we go, right here. Uh, let's go to the root causes. Totally agree. By the way, I wish the prison abolition movement would have a much more sound plan A, B, C, D. This is exactly how we're going to get to the. He's misleading his viewers. So those of you, there's over 500 people watching. Make sure you tell uh, TYT viewers that you can go to 10demandsforjustice.com and you will see those steps in the plan that he's talking about. Ideal and goal. And you and people constantly say, well, I don't have all the details. Partly I understand that, but partly it's incumbent upon you if you're in that movement to come up with a workable plan. And you need, and especially as you said, Ole, in the beginning, if you're doing something that sounds as extreme as abolishing prisons, you better have an excellent plan. And and so- you better, he said. You better have. I just read 10 demands, very well thought out. Thank you, Gemini Dragon. He said you better. So far, I haven't really heard that. But if you want me to join that pathway in that plan, I'm happy to do all of the first steps, right? Notice what he said too, when he talked about police abolition, notice he used the word extreme. You see that? This is the thing I told you before about reformists. They're only willing to go so far. Reform prisons and all the ways that we've discussed in this. But I don't believe in a utopian uh, end goal where there are no prisons. Uh, I mean, and that's, and that's fine. Listen, Cenk, that's fine. 
I want you to know that's fine. I I don't need you to believe it to believe in that or come off this phone call, uh, this this chat thinking that you're an abolitionist. Now, honestly, what really becomes a hindrance if we agree, if we Listen, there's gonna be a whole large side of the spectrum. And I believe, I wanna believe we're ultimately fighting for the same things. If we recognize that we have this prison system and it doesn't necessarily uh, amount to public safety, that we recognize that there's systemic racism and injustices coming from it. If we could at the very least work together to accomplish to get this, it's about how we speak about what the other people are doing. You know what I mean? If you ultimately recognize uh, you can share in this larger vision, at least you might not be living in a utopian society, but you recognize that there's something wrong and fundamentally we want to rid ourselves of those wrongs. If you recognize that people working on that or doing that, it's about not speaking out against someone. Two, as far as the the work you do in the interim, it's about understanding your place in a movement. For me in particular, I'm a public defender. How I go about this is one, beyond representing people in criminal court every day and trying to get them out. I'm very involved in, in policy and reform movements and trying to, to change the system that we're currently in to work towards that. So today again, I want to op-ed on bail reform. I'm actively you know pushing bail reform, drawing attention to the Rikers crisis and doing these things. So I, I wouldn't say that the organizers on the ground, they, they are involved. All these different movements that you see that you have to fight for on the day-to-day basis, those are very much so the steps and how we're working towards that. If you see all these community initiatives trying to get mental health, um, um, in one of the states, they just recently made it so you can you have a mental health first responder. You see different people advocating for taking police off of traffic infractions and these kinds of things. All those different movements and initiatives you see with people trying to divest from policing and instead build up community resources. And you see those, that is people working towards abolition. But listen, I respectfully yeah. understand where you're coming from, Jay. So Ole, I appreciate that. But we also have a short term problem, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, so like, I also don't agree in a utopian society where we do not put people in prison in the short term and hope that, that hey, hopefully the system will catch up to the ideal. No, 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 no. We're gonna, if we're gonna do it at all, we have to do it step by step. And, and we need, I wanna get to the Norwegian model, not to abolition, right? Again, of course he doesn't wanna get to towards abolition. Again, reformists. Not someone who's willing to go all the way, just someone who's willing to take, uh, let me just step right in the middle and just stop right there. So he's letting you know uh, that's not his avenue. It is what it is. It's not a surprise to me. Like I said, some of his comments about policing, defunding the police and abolition has been quite suspect and cringe lately, especially since TYT supported it when it was popular. Uh, two years ago, and they changed their position on that as well. So Jink is showing you exactly who he is and what he's about. And I really don't appreciate someone like Jink, who is not an activist, who is not involved in any type of police uh, uh, reform or, or abolition movement, telling people how it should be done and the way it should be done. Let me tell you something very clearly here, because that seems to be a trend with people who are not activists. They like to sit back and watch what the activists do. And then they like to jump in and tell them how they should be doing it and how it should work. But they never get their hands dirty with the activists or the organizers on the ground. Those people are just there to stop progress. Anytime you get a leg up, you get a little bit of leeway. Here they come with their mouths, with their tweets, anything that they can do to try to stop that from happening. Because at the end of the day, the thing is, is this. Jink Uger and Anna Kasparian are the type of people that want police to protect their neighborhoods. They want the police to protect their homes and they want the police to protect their wealth. They want the police there to protect capital, to protect people like them. Police do not protect poor people. They rarely protect working class people. They're not protecting black and brown people in these neighborhoods. But since that doesn't apply to Jink Uger and Anna Kasparian, they really don't care about that. They're not going to come out and say those words because obviously, like I told you, they've already gotten a lot of heat about some of the comments that they've made recently. So they don't want to come out and say those kind of words. But really, at the end of the day, they're really kind of telling you, fuck your community, fuck your situation. I want to be protected from people who are like you. But they won't say that because they know how bad that will sound. So I'll say it for them. But even if you want to get to the Norwegian model, you have to go step by step. You have to have the mental health treatment, et cetera, in place before, yeah. me, before and then actually, maybe, we say, hold on guys, let yeah. me finish. Why is he talking to them like that? Before, in place, before. See how they come in and try to tell you how to do your own activism? 
before we say, hey, you know what? We're not gonna put these folks in prison. Because Olay, right now, what we did, I was massively in favor of bail reform. I'm beginning to think I was wrong. Uh, and 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 why? Uh, and and reducing some crimes. Look, it makes a lot of sense because the current the things that the sentences we fought for, and you're a public defender, so you'd have an interesting perspective on this. The sentences we fought for, I think, are the better sentences, the, the more just sentences, the ones that are reduced. But the problem is the prosecutors are need room for plea deals. And since they don't have room for plea deals, they're bringing them all the way down to almost nothing. So then the prosecutors aren't bothering to prosecute these crimes, and the cops aren't bothering to arrest people. And Ole saying it's not happening is, it's not, Productive. It's you're saying, you, Cenk, you want to say you're telling me it's not productive, but I'm actually the person that represents people in court and has a like a literally living array of what the system looks like. And I can tell you that one, the arrests are happening. Two studies have already come out and showed that in terms of being rearrested for violating pretrial bail conditions, that has not changed. Whether or not crime rates check, that is that is simply the case. But here's the thing: I just I want to I want to um, circle back to my original point earlier with. Why even the modest reform efforts to get us towards people? People criticize abolition when people say the system is not broken; it's working as intended. We're going to keep we're going to keep recycling these exact same effects. And I say the problem is not that people would not get on board with reform. Abolitionists is that we recognize that even the reform, even the most modest of reforms, risk experience this kind of pushback and lack of support. So I want to say that one, two. Yeah. When it comes to bail reform, if we want to look at a place like New York City, right? The majority we have. 10 million people in this city, 42% of which are white. Yet over 90% of the people at Rikers are black or brown people. Rikers is a pretrial yep. detention center. It was built to hold 3,000 people. It holds 5,000. We had modest bail reform. We had bail reform come in to make misdemeanors, only misdemeanors, not completely nonviolent crimes, traffic infractions, these things not bail eligible. Because despite the fact and the sensationalism you see from New York Post and the particular occasional cases they highlight, that's not what the majority of people are sitting in Rikers for. I'm just so sorry to tell you. And so that we get overcrowded, we get people dying. We have we had the largest amount of deaths since 2013 last year. 16 last year, we're already at 15 this year. So, and let's not forget the 16 year old boy who was sent to Rikers for stealing a book bag that he never stole. There's a documentary about him on Netflix. Actually, I'm not sure if it's still there. It was up there. Uh, I know at least last year. Uh, 16 years old. After he finally got out, he, he committed suicide because of what he went through in Rikers. So oh, this continues to happen, and that happens at pretrial uh, pretrial detention centers all around the country. And in terms of plea deals and pressures for plea deals, most things in the criminal system don't end in the criminal conviction, right? Most things in the criminal yep. system never see the light of a trial. What happens is they arrest poor people, they are able to place cash bail on them, and because these people are they free, they can't buy their freedom. They accept plea deals. They take time served. They accept criminal convictions just because they want to get out, even though. That's right. That's right. A lot of times, people who are poor, who people who cannot afford cash bail, don't even get a trial. See, if you watch enough of these law and order type shows, they make it seem like someone is arrested. They go to jail. They say, you can get out on bail. I can't afford the bail. And then all of a sudden they have a trial like three months later. That actually doesn't happen for a lot of people who are poor or people who are working class. They don't even get to that point. They don't get to the point where they have a trial. This is why I say, if you have a lot, if you're wealthy, the system works pretty well for you. Not if you're poor. Talk your stuff, Olami. Oh, if the system actually were allowed to play out the way it's supposed to and afford them their rights, that wouldn't have happened. And then they get out and now they have a criminal conviction that makes it worse. These were already the poorest people in society. Yep. It's a fact that the court recognized when they assigned them a public defender and when they gave them bail. And yet these people now have a criminal conviction that prevents them from getting any kind of job. They usually lost the job that they have. It affects their housing, there's orders of protection and their lives are changed in fundamental ways that no longer just impacts them, but impacts their family in a cycle of that contributes to violence, it contributes to crime, and it doesn't help anybody get anywhere. So as far as what you're talking about with bail reform, the reality, despite the fair mongering and everything that's happened, is it hasn't changed our crime rates. People who are being released from Rikers or they're not being detained because their cases are not junk, you don't have to agree, you don't have to agree with me, yeah. but the reality is I have experience with it. So, so yeah. wait, talk that talk, oh Limey. Yes, you let him know. This is her wheelhouse. This is not his wheelhouse. He's not a public defender. She knows she's in, she's been in the court system. She knows how it works. 
And that right there, at that moment, she just slayed them. <laughs> she came in like a dragon and just slay. <laughs> let me, Hold let me. on. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but Olay's responding to me shaking my head off camera, which she can see. And and I, I'm happy to do it mm -hmm. on camera, right? So look, the well, first of all, number of uh, people rearrested awaiting trial. That was a clown move, shaking my head off camera. Oh, and by the way, I'm happy to do it on camera. He's such a clown. Is all the way up to 33% of the detainees in New York. Uh, and and so the idea that it's not happening is just not true. And you have your perspective on it, which is really valuable, and that's why we're having this discussion. Olay is telling you in her experience that is the the recidivists, et cetera, are a tiny minority. The overwhelming majority are poor folks. Okay. Do you believe in a presumption of innocence? Yeah, of course I do. Do uh, you? Yeah, I do. I do. Olay, hold on, let me finish. But Olay, you're invalidating the experiences of all. Tons of middle class and working class and poor people in this country who are saying there's a guy on the corner selling fentanyl. I'm calling the cops. They're not coming. There's a guy on the corner with a gun. He's pointing it at me as I'm walking into my apartment. I call the cops. They're not coming. And they're not coming because they say, and by the way, I, I, I think the cops are terrible. I think they should be forced to do their jobs. And if He don't think they're that terrible. He don't think they're that terrible. And it's funny how he's speaking for middle class, poor and working class people. He's in none of those groups. He's wealthy. He's in none of those groups. You see, do you see now why those of us at RBN, why we critique the PMC so hardly? CJ's really great at this, by the way. Do you see why? Because for all these years, Jink Uger, Anna Kasparian, a lot of wealthy people in this space have been speaking for people who are middle class, people who are working class, people who are poor, and they're not in any of those groups. And now here he is trying to tell her about her own job. they don't they should be fired immediately okay but they say hey listen the prosecutors aren't prosecuting and the prosecutors are saying we don't have enough uh room for plea negotiations you're saying that's i don't know what you're, you're saying, saying, saying to that's me not you're true. saying to Everybody's me that we need that you're saying to me that we need to have a cash bail system so that prosecutors can better coerce no, people I, no hold on let me just let me let me let me let me respond to this it sounds like you live in Gotham City, Shank, but I live in New York City, where people can you can call the police and you will be you will be very much so arrested. I don't know what you're talking about. We have massive amounts of cases. We have people being arrested 24/7. Bail reform does not affect people being able to make arrests. Like I said, felonies, felonies, violent crime, cash bail is still being set on these things. The only things cash bail is not being set on are a small amount of misdemeanors and low-level traffic infractions. We very much so we just not only do we have a massive we have over 35,000 police in NYPD, but we recently hired more. We increased their $10.4 billion budget to $200 million more dollars. So I don't know why we're talking about the police um, like they are handicapped and like arrests aren't happening. Additionally, you're saying I'm invalidating the concerns of of uh, poor people and black people. And so I don't know what you're talking about, but I am a black person that lives in Brooklyn in Flatbush. Yeah. And I don't know many black people that are fully in favor of the massive police state we have or the criminal system that affects us. And importantly, as much as we talk about this, we have this alarmist discussion of crime and the people that are experiencing the most crime, the people that live in these communities, these high high crime areas, these highly profile, they're the same people that you're the same people that are the victims of crime, the same black people that are victims of crime, brown people that are victims of crime, the same people you're criminalizing and 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 vilifying and saying, okay, we shouldn't have these systems in place so that prosecutors can barely um, better better uh, coerce them into plea deals or get them to do these things. It just, I also think. I think you're relying on a lot of, of what is just ultimately propaganda. That is a thing. They put out these articles. Ooh. All right, Jay. But okay, listen, hold on. Let me jump in. Part. Please, 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 please let me jump uh -huh. in because I'm, I'm dying to. I, I actually, look, I don't have a problem with bail reform. I actually think using bail as a way to determine whether someone gets to go home prior to the trial is ridiculous, right? And And it's a way of kind of determining whether or not someone is a risk, right? And so the judge is trying to determine, well, this person seems risky. So what's a high amount for bail? So I can prevent this person yeah. from being able to post bail and, and get out early. I think that whole system is messed up. So I have no problem with doing away with cash bail, but I do think it's important for the judge to have some discretion in regard to individuals who are, uh, 
accused of committing violent crimes, right? And and judge doesn't have the discretion. No, no, you're right about that. Yeah. Okay, you're right about that. But I, I think that there is a misunderstanding, and I've been reading and researching about this because I've been trying to figure out why is it that in some parts of the country where they've done bail reform, specifically for misdemeanors, you have examples of judges giving um, uh, alleged violent offenders no cash bail. Like, why is that happening? And it's because they, it seems like they have a fundamental misunderstanding of what the bail reform is supposed to entail. And I watched a, a great talk that you did in regard to Illinois and their safety measure, which mm -hmm. uh, you know they're applying this no cash bail uh, method to uh, nonviolent misdemeanor crimes. And you mm -hmm. made sure to emphasize this is about misdemeanors. This is not about you know violent crimes. Uh, crime or violent offenders. And so it seems like you are honestly on the same page, right? I mean, I would like to see something else in place other than bail that determines whether or not an individual should be released. And one other thing that I don't think gets talked about enough is why is it taking so long for the trial to happen? I mean, right. people are that's on purpose though, by the way. Delaying trials like that's on purpose. Are behind bars for years before they even get to see the first day of their trial. It's insane. And I'll tell you why, because the system is deliberately punitive, right? What happens is the majority of people in our criminal system just would not, if we actually were able to prosecute every single case, everybody was able to go to a trial, everybody's able to have the hearings, evidence was be able to present it and everything. Most things simply just would be thrown out. They wouldn't be able to get criminal convictions. So what often happens is throughout the process, they make the process as laborious and punitive as possible. Let's let's keep right. adjourning it, even though we'll, there are cases we have at arraignments, we know it's sad on the record, they will not be able to prosecute this. There's the, the alleged victim is in the audience saying absolutely not. And they say, you know what? Let's still gonna adjourn to this state. We'll work it out another time when we adjourn and we adjourn and we make this this way because what happens yep. is the time you have a criminal case open, your life is completely, it's completely changed. And if you can't have your trial, if you're waiting in on jail, what happens is before you have a trial, you serve the time, even though eventually you might, you know, they'll throw it out or they don't have the evidence or they'll decline to prosecute or you go to trial. and. You're, but you've already suffered all the consequences, all right. the harm has actually been implemented, so that's why. Mm -hmm. Ole, I, I wish we could spend the rest of the show talking. And that is a fact. What can I say? What can I say? Jink, Uger, how dare you try to come on and tell this woman about her job? How dare you try to tell this woman about what she's seen in the prison system and what she's seen in the courtroom? Shame on you. All I mean for the win. Taking home the trophy like a champ. That's what I'm talking about. She took it home, took it to the house. I'm going to go to some of the comments here. Uh, JB Font, it's good that they had her on, but they could have reached out to Nick, Zoya, or Awkward. Yeah, they could reach out to them. Like I said, they're the co founders of 10 Demands for Justice. Um, but I honestly, I mean, Anna Kasparian blocked me a long time ago. Uh, if she blocked me, she probably blocked Nick and them too. <laughs> Robert Ice and DEA need to go. JB says bad people go to prison. What they don't tell us is that there are good people in prison too. Also, our system creates circumstances that make people so bad things, do bad things, which puts them in prison. Latif, they don't do traffic stops in Germany. I, being black, appreciated the culture. I hear you. You know, sometimes I ask myself like, man, why we had to come back here? <laughs> I love Germany. Germany was awesome. Delthea, Jink and company are no longer the top of the food chain, but they burned so bridges. They now have a fiend ignorance of their own statements and pretend they are hearing things for the first time. Mm-hmm. JB, also, how did these violent criminals come about? Couldn't it also be contributed to and by a system that doesn't center people, but centers profit instead. Absolutely. Yasmin says there needs to be real rehabilitation for people in prison too. They come out and have culture shock because they can't adjust to society. Bingo. Rodrigo, in my hometown in Cali, you can go to the grocery store and you see people on the streets like it's normal. This is the point. This is the state we're in. JB says, we don't consider what leads people to do some of these crimes. Our system greatly contributes to it. Exactly. See, Larson, all people in Congress should be made to live homeless for two weeks. Oh, that would be interesting. That would be interesting.
Uh, Latif, I waited six months because my attorney didn't have an earlier date available. All that time didn't count towards shit. My time started after my sentencing. See that you guys hear these stories? Carrie, I am working poor and I have been a victim of a violent crime. I don't want prisons for people who need help. That's interesting to hear, Carrie. Thank you for the super chat, Blunts and Otters. <laughs> Blunts and Otters. <laughs> Glenn Greenwald said it best. Most news people know they're lying, but when it comes to Jink, he actually is that stupid. Oh, damn. <laughs> Glenn Greenwald said that. Jinx from Jersey, which explains it all. Ah, Greg Brewer says she just bodied both of them fighting the good fight. <laughs> she did. Oh, I mean for the win. I'm telling you, she took them all down. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. R. That woman ran so many laps on the TYT host. She was running a marathon. Yes. Yes. 